You are listening to Radio Belvaspata, South Africa. This show is dedicated to those who live and love from the heart in infinite ways. In today's episode, we will discuss, share, gain insights and get clarity on the wisdom and teachings of the mystic and seer Almin, as well as discover more about the miraculous healing modality called Belvaspata. Your host for this show is Paul. Hello everyone, you're listening to Radio Belvas Pata, South Africa. I'm your host Paul. This is our show for Thursday the 23rd of March 2017. Thank you very much for joining us in studio. We are very excited to have you here. Tonight we have got some great audio coming in from various sources including the mystic and Seer Almin. But first of all let's listen to some wisdom um, just as I read out uh, a process which I found earlier today and it fits perfectly in with the theme of our show. The theme of our show is about genesis, immortality and exuberant passion. And in my opinion and in my current experience of life as it is unfolding, I think we've achieved genesis, I think we've achieved immortality, but have we yet achieved exuberant passion? Time will tell. Let's discover about this today. The Seer Almin tells us there is no growth needed, but neither can there be stagnation. Stagnation must yield to the exuberant gushing forth of the one life. And that's some beautiful comment from the mystic and seer Almin. There's a proclamation to remove ancient hierarchies as printed in the formula of boundlessness. And I'm going to give you the uh, mother's language and the angelic language around that. And this is where it goes. Nestra bli vibra vach ses at vi eranash. Prihat usta set bli vach sus at vi eraset. Garasach nen sur eklat urasbi mistavach nen klut urasbi. Sekve ustavlit misach minavesh eristu hiklat bri vales uras. Nesmapur sesat vi ekret visel vi brihiaras par nesta ravek blisebach arasat minach vi nach stu ararat. Krihanat bliva bech estrek bribas anasve klavanas. Erektra brisat vi nesklavit arech unes briset vi. Nansarak brihes uspechve kri vilaves esta michpe kriwanet prives bi eskrasut sevet etret brihachvi ninaves skrihu anet prava. And if you'd like to find out what all of that means, stay with us. In the meantime, we're going to listen to TV personality and creator of Shots of War, Jason Silver, as we learn how to clear our perception. So one of the things that happens when we grow older with our nodding resignation into nothingness is that we enter a kind of consciousness known as the been there's and done that's of the adult mind, right? It's that notion when nothing excites or overwhelms anymore because you've seen it all before. And what a tragedy this is, right? I mean, come on. I mean, we all remember nostalgically the intensity of experiencing something for the first time. Seeing the world through the eyes of a child, wonderstruck and entranced by awe, right? Succumbing to astonishment, giving in to astonishment, mouth gaped wide. I mean, damn, to see something for the first time. But then what happens? Then you assimilate, you model it in your brain, you store it in your library of been there's and done that, and you no longer engage, right, sensorially with stimuli. It's called hedonic adaptation. Familiarity breeds boredom. It's so depressing, right? And so what do we do? Well, I think this is where 
mindful self inquiry comes in. This is where meditation, this is where breathing exercises and yoga comes in. This is where boarding a craft that flies you across the world can be therapeutic, like injecting you with a little bit of life by stimulating you and jet lagging you and placing you in an entirely different wallpaper of the mind. It's what it's why travel revitalizes. It's why people self medicate. Sometimes tweaking our perception. Sometimes that marijuana joint can be the magnifying lens or the pane of glass that doesn't distort reality but confers on phenomena a certain feeling of distance as David Lenson says. Perhaps that's why a museum hangs an ordinary item and puts it on the wall, decontextualizes it and brings our attention back to it, right? We get to enter the archetypical space where the specific stands in for all of its kind stands in for the universal right we like to enter a modality of consciousness known as plato's realm of ideals i mean that's where you live in the present that's when anxiety about the future and melancholy for the past get drowned out by the ever present rapture of the now and we are free And in that moment we are Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden before eating from the tree of knowledge knowing no death knowing only now and the bliss of now If only we could get back there I support whatever works as long as you don't hurt anybody else And there we were listening to TV host Jason Silva as he worked through one of his beautiful explanations called Shots of Awe. And this one was entitled Cleansing Your Perception. I think always an important journey for us always every day as we step up, as we get into our day, as we enter into new connections, as we forge new relationships day by day is also always to ensure that we cleanse the perception um, before we enter into that particular process. Uh, very exciting process for me working there, and I really value the way that Jason Silva expresses himself, and I think such a pertinent part of the way life can unfold as we can see it in a different way every every single moment. The um, We're going to listen to an audio from the mystic and Sia Almin now, and it's a bit of an old one that comes in from last year where she says, the world has gone mad, and what to do about it? And we're going to just dive into this whole audio with Almin as she tackles some of the deep uh, metaphysical understandings and experience. And she's going to talk about the different stages of immortality and even form a life beyond all of that. Discover how she, along with her class at that point, unlocks insights and reveals the hidden layers of some of life's deepest mysteries. Here's this year, Almin. In seeing the daily news of attacks everywhere on citizens, within family members, killing one another, etc., we are left wondering, has the world gone mad? And actually, the answer is yes. And the answer pertains to the material we have been discussing. In looking at at the resurrection and the different forms of light, that it generates, etc. Let's take a look at it very closely. When we go into resurrection, a very extraordinary thing happens. Transcendence lifts us into a whole new reality. But it is a reality that has left duality behind. The world of opposites becomes integrated. Hot and cold become integrated. Sleep and wakefulness becomes integrated. It is the integration of opposites that the mind cannot cope with. It is used to labeling and then giving value to opposites. This is good, that is bad. It doesn't know what to do 
when those two merge. And you might ask, well, the people where this is happening aren't people that have gone into resurrection. Resurrection is such a major step for even one of those who walk among humanity to accomplish that it is a puzzle piece that changes its shape completely and therefore all the pieces of the puzzle have to reconform. It's a fractal shape in the middle of the fractal pattern that changes and all the patterns around it has to change. If it's dramatic enough of a change, that is what happens. And resurrection is. So no, they may not be resurrecting the masses where these things are happening. However, they are affected by those who are resurrected. And it creates madness because the mind doesn't know what to do with becoming a contradiction. Opposites unite. Well, what are we going to do about this? Because the world is indeed experiencing attacks in many countries all over the world on its citizens. And madness, even amongst those who come, we come in contact with on a daily basis. Insanity in their reactions. What are we going to do about it? Well, today we're going to learn a little another interesting fact about opposites. View the fabric of life as a beautiful weaving. Then see somebody make a gash in it with a knife. And because the tapestry is pulled relatively tight, say, over a frame, it opens up like a wound. It makes a gap in between. That means opposites have form. Between opposites, there is a gap. A gap of what? A gap of of knowledge, a gap of answers. Can you see where this is going? Because I have said to you that those who go into that third level resurrection where a white light is generated, that is not just any white light. It is a white light with very specific sacred qualities. It is brilliantly white. Because white light is that which carries answers. This carries all possible answers as they change moment by moment. We become the glowing bright light of the Akashic living records. We have the answers. The answers is that which fills the gap between opposites. Now, when the opposites are apart and then they just suddenly come together, now there's no longer opposites, the mind goes into insanity. However, if you have two poles that have pulled apart, there's a gap in between, and you fill that gap, which is a gap of knowledge, with knowledge, with answers. Even though, as I explained in our online seminar, um, that will be coming up in October, even though we may not need those answers. They are there for us. That eliminates the need for demons to embody the questions. It eliminates the need for mind to go into insanity because the gap is closing. The gap is closing with answers so that it doesn't befuddle and confuse the mind by being a contradiction. Hot and cold are the same thing is different than there is a range of answers that combine them into a cohesive answer and that the mind can deal with. So if we generate the white light, how do we do that? In the first level, we generate the magenta. In the second level, we generate the violet light and in the third level of resurrection we generate the gold light of glad expectations 
When you put those together, they make white light because the three of them contain all the primary colors. The colors combined create the white light and then a sacred metamorphosis happens with the white light and that change in the white light is that becomes all-knowing, living, ever renewed and it becomes such a font of knowledge that there is no need for any creature to embody chaos. you're back in studio i'm paul and handling our sound desk tonight is nico once again thank you for staying with us we were listening there to the mystic and seer almin as she went into the discourse about how the world has gone mad and what to do about it and even though uh, that particular audio and video came out last year she was talking about a course in october 2016 um absolutely pertinent for the moment and we're still seeing those ongoing issues and problems around the world especially i.e uh, london yesterday um, yet again under attack for whatever form and nature that is um, and whatever our reasoning and perception is these things are happening and they are some form of a reality yet how we perceive it and see it i suppose is up to us and our programming and beliefs as well as what we understand about these things so a point of today's show is that because it's entitled Genesis, Immortality and Exuberant Passion, I made a comment at the opening of today's show saying that I think we've achieved Genesis, I think we've achieved immortality and uh, the question really is have we yet achieved this exuberant passion. Had a very interesting visit today, had one of those occasional visits, uh, went into my doctor's big waiting rooms um, kind of a medical hospital setup that I go through and as I was sitting there I was just aware of how many people were sitting slumped into corners absolutely just wrapped up either in their mobile phones on text messages playing games etc etc but the look of absolute um, surrender if, if that's the word I, I can accurately use at this moment but just surrender to the way life was hitting them left right and center and I couldn't see any happiness on any level there within any one of them. And they're definitely all playing that particular role. But for me, it was very, very interesting how they were just so locked up within themselves. And then I thought, well, this is interesting because we obviously must be stepping through some form of a bridge. Um, and Almin was talking in that uh, audio there about the different aspects of, you know, labeling and giving value to opposites. And I think that's a very pertinent thing for many people at the moment is that they are living in the opposite as an alternative, but they have not yet realized that an opposite is still the same side of another coin. Um, and Almin was also talking about magenta, the violet and the golden light really merging into the magic of the white light. Uh, and I'm thinking that's where our titles go at the moment. We started off with the magenta, merged into the violet, uh, merged with the golden and then we produce something else so we're definitely stepping over a bridge at the moment and so for me the genesis aspect of tonight's show is really about the magenta light the immortality is the next the violet perhaps an exuberant passion should be the response of you know the golden violet and magenta light all merging together but very definitely going through massive changes in the book by the mystic and seer i mean called the thought that fractured the infinite and how the dream began it's a very interesting opening process because the first chapter of that book is called Genesis. And I don't think it's any accident that it is called Genesis when we look at it in a scriptural level of information. And I'd just like to read out the first page for you because it is just so fascinating in terms of our understanding and the experiences. So check your belief systems right now at the door and see how this triggers off uh, the love in your heart. And let's work through that. So it starts off transmissions from the infinite. Defining the steps through which individuated life formed is like grasping a rainbow in your fist. 
ever more will it move from your reach. Not even a wisp can you capture. But in trying to encompass the ever unfolding mystery, your being will blossom and your infinite potential unfold. Seek to understand the uncountable facets of my face. But do not deceive yourself that you could possibly succeed. The mind tries to limit by defini definition what the heart would enfold in a fathomless embrace. Even as you pursue me, I laugh at you through the eyes of a child. I am the temple in which you strive to know me. I am the brothel in which your twisted seekings would find yourself. My being cannot be divided from itself. There is therefore no thing that I am not. The sub-creation of men may obscure my perfection to the eyes of those who see only appearance, yet it is there. In the midst of conflict lies my peace. In a night of sorrow and loss there gleams the light of my promise of eternal life. As the spider web ensnares the glory of the butterfly, so does it also reveal the exquisite patterns of the dewdrops. In the sub-creations of man that which I am not stands revealed thereby affording a glimpse into the perfection of what I am. Kenesh hurit eristrava manuvit, kranech ba ur esta vereva vranubit erstuvi. I slumber in the unfolding rose. I rise upon the eagle's wing beats as he mounts the air. And that's the opening page really for transmissions from the infinite um, end of the chapter, the beginning chapter of Genesis in the thought that fractured the infinite by the book. Absolutely incredible as you look at it and work with it. And of course, you'll find that on Almin's store at spiritualjourneys.com. And perhaps there are links in Almin diary at the same time. It's available as a download, by the way. So a lot easier for you to get a lot quicker. And uh, just put that on your reader or your phone and keep working through it because there's the different aspects of the transmission from the infinite highlights. So many incredible moments of Genesis of the beginning as light then manifested. And of course, what I'm seeing now is all these different lights carry their own frequencies. And as we merge them together into living in the highest process of the white light that we can, absolute incredible moments happen and immortality takes us center stage and then we go beyond into a life unknown at that particular point so let's listen now to Almin as she talks about immortality and beyond this is an old class by the way it's about three years old um, but so pertinent and I look forward to seeing you on the other side everything about transformation transmutation and transfiguration that linear triangle that has made that disk of life move is to fix life. All of it has one thing in common. Mm. It fixes life. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how it prolongs life. Transformation. Death is a purification process. It's because there are such insights that you didn't get that finally, okay, the best way you can get it is from expanded vision, which happens when you're not incarnate, when you're in the spirit world because you didn't get, get things. So my loves, there's another way to do this. Um, the transformation, you can beat death and prolong life through immortality for about 10,000 years. If you get your insights day by day by day. They have found in university studies that if you get new insights each day that there's a hormone released that they call the youthening hormone. So this journey we're on, um, you know, my brother Andre and myself, we, we were talking last night about someone that's a very dear sister to me, but she's just basically said, you know, so long and farewell. And that's fine. This journey's not for everybody. But he commented on how rapidly in one year she aged just astonishing and the reason is up until that point there were these dramatic insights every day and it can be frequency insight there's a different way of getting things with frequency but my brothers and sisters what it does is release the hormone the youth hormone because as you get the insight the old drops away and it makes the purification ritual called death 
are necessary for a very long time. It's not indefinite because when life and death are two opposites, we are going, we cannot just enhance one versus the other. For example, many of the yogis or the, the um, Buddhas and so on have, have said, you know, we don't need to incarnate anymore. That's the same as the immortal saying, I don't need to die anymore. One is no different than the other. It's just two different sides of one, one stick. You can't say the stick is only one end. So, you know, to say, okay, I don't need death anymore, I'm immortal, fine. To say, I don't need to incarnate anymore, it's an equal, hollow boast. Because ultimately, you cannot rob life, and ultimately, you cannot rob death. So eventually, you have to either move to, to the transmutation, 10,000 years later, or you have to recycle again through death. If you move from transformation to living life, primarily from transmutation, now you can prolong life to about 100,000 years. The reason I say about is that it depends very much on the level of, of density we are in, in, in life, where we are on the circle, how long certain things take. Transmutation <coughs> gives you what's called incorruptibility. Immortality <coughs> is part of transformation. Incorruptibility is part of transmutation. So, what incorruptibility does, how it cheats death, how it says to death, I don't need to go there, is it lives on a, on a cycle, because you know this big, this big oval, it's within ourselves. It's our incarnations. We just describe it as the cosmos's <coughs> incarnations. But it's also us, our, our incarnations. So, when it's time for death to take place, what, what the transmutation does is it just moves you up to where your next incarnation would have been. So now you've, you've skipped this detour, oh, yeah. you see, and you move to where uh -huh. your next incarnation would have been. So in that way, you can prolong life very long time. You don't need a new body to be. Um, the body does renew itself through its frequency. Because what if you're on the frequency going upwards, there's a whole new body that is there. And it, it, it just renews itself. Just the way the lead turns to gold, mm -hmm the body turns to the next level, which is gold, and the next and the next. So it moves out of the way of where it has to pay the price of death. When you go to transfiguration, you know, I've been using that, and I don't know if there is an end to it. Um, I would suspect not, because of the, you know, it just is an indefinite sequence of zeros. So my brothers and sisters, there, you just come and you re reshape yourself. I sometimes, I look in the mirror and I say, it's time, you know, I, it's just time to renew the body. And then you go out and you come back in. What makes it, um, what makes it more than life? How does it, how does it affect, you said you gain from it, but at the same time it's taxing on you. So yes. that seems contradictory. Yes, it is. It's like you, a forced pace. It's not, it's like the feminine, she can't get out of her four little cycles, okay? But she, she's being forced by the masculine, and so she keeps bumping her head, you know, as he moves full downward. It's a forced pace, Jennifer, and it's sometimes not very n easy for the nervous system. And so it feels very stressful. Um, we have, here's Mark, go ahead. In fact, you s you've just said that you suspect that the way of transfiguration does never end. Yes. But we know there is something beyond the yes. triangle of uh, linear change. So there would be a, a state at least You're right. beyond transfiguration. Yes. And I suspect this would be the state of the, the gods of Agawavanti since they've been around for trillions of years. 
So is that the case? Um, let me look at that statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me look at that. This is all part of linearity that uses masculine and feminine. So it's part of separation. Anything that has entered into separation has an end. So I'm wrong? You're absolutely right. Anything that has entered into separation must have an end because it had a beginning. A reminder of the cosmic mantra given by Almin for today, the 23rd of March. I dwell in meditation by living with full attention to the moment. By the angel Ethelvet, the sub-personality there is the nurturer. Today's show is really about nurturing ourselves and understanding the dynamics of what has been achieved by each one of us in this journey we call life. And of course, we move beyond into a different life. So there today, we've already proved Genesis achieved, immortality achieved. And especially when we think about the abilities of being able to time travel, to understand that the future is there and that we are able to stretch ourselves from this point into the future, right through that whole bridge. Uh, really, it means that immortality has been achieved. And Almin was there explaining in that class how the aspects can really, really work together. So you'll be asking yourself one little thing at this moment in self, or you might not be, but I'm going to tell you what it is. The aspect of what does Bel Vaspata healing as a modality have to do with all of this that we're talking about today? Well, let's look at this, because if we go into the book, um, you know, the, the thought that fractured the infinite into the first chapter of Genesis, Genesis and transmissions from the infinite, there's a chapter there that the infinite gave information on, and it's called Living from the White Light. Okay, so during the dream, life existed predominantly from the blue color of my being as the red and yellow lights vied with one another. The red light sought to expand the boundary, the yellow to contain it. The blue contracted, and at the center of the contraction was mankind, whose vision did not allow him to see other realms living around him. These patterns, obsolete now that the cosmos has awakened, are causing inner turmoil and pressure. An androgynous melding of expansion and contraction needs to occur. Perpetuation of contraction, a form of ego identity experienced even by masters, creates tension in the muscles. This is most notable in the stomach. It takes the surrender of an individual into the large flow of life for expanded vision to unfold, then a return to the details to see the difference and finally the ability to live in both states at once. This is living in focused meditation. So just that chapter alone fits so absolutely beautiful in with our uh, mantra of the day that we've got and just bringing Balvaspata healing back into it. Please understand is that Balvaspata is a nurturing healing modality. It takes us to the point where it has planted seeds of angelic transmission within each one of us, each one of us practicing and receiving that particular healing. And then what it happens is when the red and yellow and blue lights within, with all, all the frequencies of these angelic sigils and lines, as they all become one, then so we enter into a complete new consciousness and we learn to surrender as an individual into the large flow of life. And perception changes because we begin to enter into what's called an expanded vision. So you can see living from the white light, using Belvas Patar, and using all of those processes together, how we actually go through the state of achieving the, the birth of Genesis, moving into the state of immortality and beyond. And then we're going to go discuss about the aspects of exuberant passion in a little while. Team Bell Vaspata Healing South Africa facilitates one-on-one, -on -one, group or distant healings utilizing a cutting-edge angelic healing modality that harmonizes and balances using a combined process of light and frequency.
This cosmic healing modality has various protocols available that will assist in the transformation, transmutation and transfiguration of many areas of life. Visit our website on www.belvaspata.co.za for complete information and also link to us on Facebook under our name Team Belvaspata Healing South Africa. You may also send an email to belvaspata at anua.co.za. You can join our WhatsApp discussion group for daily posts and trending information and updates from Almin, the seer and mystic. Message us via either Facebook, email or on the station's commentary section. We will now return to the online chat show hosted by Team Belvaspata South Africa and our guests for the day. My beloved brothers and sisters, we will now explain the connection between the time map and a life of high magic more fully. A life of high magic is a life of limitlessness. It is boundless, something that the brain does not understand. So the brain tends to contract, to become egoic when confronted with a boundless life. The time map is like a bridge that helps the brain transition into limitlessness. In other words, it's a vehicle that the brain can understand and cooperate with so that it doesn't rebel and send you backwards as a vehicle that moves through the boundlessness. So whenever there is this underlying fear that certainly I confronted as I entered into this stage during its first phase, shall we say, I don't know what lies beyond, but there is definite fear and I trace the fear to the brain's concern about losing control as it goes into boundlessness. When you experience that, you immediately focus on the guidance of your time map. The time map helps give a reference point, just like your car is a reference point as it travels through open countryside. You don't know what lies across these fields, but you do know that you're inside the car, which helps to create a sense of reference, understanding, and contentment. So now, the activation of your time map as a vehicle for the life of high magic is done in this ceremony. And there we were listening to the mystic and seer Almin in a recent audio that was posted up on Almin Diary where she spoke about the vehicle for high magic and helping the brain transition into boundlessness. So this aspect of boundlessness and limitlessness is something that I've been working on and looking at and uh, very, very uh, clear for me at this moment in time is that as we move into a state of boundlessness, the exuberant passion will then return for life as it unfolds anew every single day. Because remember the beginning of the show, Almin says there's no growth needed, but neither can there be stagnation. Stagnation must yield 
to the exuberant gushing forth of the one life. And that's where I think as we've achieved Genesis, as we've achieved this incredible state of immortality as a chosen tool of life, then we start to move into this exuberant passion. And goodness me, it seems to me that so many people can use it. At this moment, many, many people are stuck. Many people are just staring into space, not able to process a lot of things as we all dissolve the density of the old. Again, let's just talk a little bit about <clears throat> the book, The Thought That Fractured the Infinite. And in the second transmission from the infinite, there is a very pertinent um, chapter there, which I'm just linking with the healing modality of Balvaspata. So here we go. The infinite states here. Now you must know of the 300 potencies of light. 300 there are in each of the three primary colors of the red, the yellow and the blue. Each color has 300 nuances, or depths of color if you wish to describe it so. The fracturing of light, although it occurred through contraction, has brought about this depth of knowledge. Conveying to my children the methods for utilizing the potencies of light would not have been possible had light not separated and revealed its magnificence at the dawn of individuated life. The separation of light into its three primary colors of red, which expands, Yellow, which in turn holds the boundaries, and blue, which contracts, is this day changed. Yellow's old program of keeping rigid boundaries now provides balance, stability, and contentment. Memories about having to attack anything threatened, threatening the status quo then need to be removed. Yellow represents the frequency of praise and must also be cleared of impurities. All memories of praise being used to manipulate with an agenda or only for doing versus being must be cleared. Red's memories that it had caused the fracturing to occur and brought about duress by asking contradictory questions needs to be healed. Its feeling that there is a price to pay for its expansion which causes blue to contract must also be healed. The frequency of red is gratitude. The perception that gratitude can only be for what we receive or achieve rather than what we have, must be cleared. Blue has memories of victimhood, of being plunged into the captivity of the dream state by red. Therefore it does not trust red's expansion, and when red tries to do so, blue then contracts. Its emotion is love, but love cannot exist in the absence of trust or in the presence of fear. Let this be cleared this day. Let all three colors be cleared of the memory that there is a need for aggression to defend their function. There is instability when these three primary colors are separated. The masculine pole of yellow should be joined to the red's feminine, creating orange. The feminine pole of the yellow should be joined to the masculine part of blue, making green. The masculine pole of the red should be joined to the feminine of the blue, making purple. Then all are joined into a field that is white light. This information is necessary to properly wield the potencies of light. The plant kingdom has the ability to turn light into chlorophyll and utilize its potency in a life-giving way. The first level of alchemy of light I shall give you uses plants as an interface. And so the book then goes into the different aspects of the alchemy of all of this. But this is the basics around the healing modality of Belvas. But as we use these three different colors of red, blue, yellow, through the sigils of love, praise, and gratitude, which holds in the angelic healing that is present at that moment through any of those healing interactions. Uh, really incredible just to watch all the dynamics that are play. And this is what I'm saying earlier as we listen to Almina. She's talking about the magenta, the violet, and the golden, all merging into the white light. And we can see as the masculine and feminine aspects of these uh, primary colors are all brought into um, fullness through their different nuances, then we can see that they merge into magenta, into violet, into gold, and the three of those then move into the higher state of white light. Absolutely fascinating for all of us just to listen to. Right, so if you go into spiritualjourneys.com, um, you can and just search the formula of boundlessness. This is a 2013 PDF document which is still available online, and you can download it. And there's a beautiful sigil and wheel on there called the Formula of Boundlessness. And it's called Shavach Vir Sata Manunesh Ashantavi. And translated for us means sovereignty to the one 
expressing as the many. And then we've brought the whole dynamic of things together as we're going along. So I read out all the different ancient language there of, of the infinite as the proclamation to remove ancient hierarchies. And that fascinates me some more because we can see as we move beyond immortality, as we move into life unfolding into a life of exuberant passion, we have so many different aspects going on. And I'd like to just highlight just for a few minutes the sigils for the purification of our life as we live in boundlessness, as the mind and the brain surrenders to the fact that there is far more to it than what we saw as the matrix dissolves around our lives, then definitely we really begin to understand the dynamics of it. So I'll go to that in a few minutes, but please also understand that the languages, um, the colors, each of the colors you spoke, each has its own language as well, and each color has 300 glyphs, and so on and so on and so on, and each glyph would have angelic beings. So you can see as we are using these sigils of Bel Vaspita, you're not just calling in one angelic being, you're calling in a whole host of them, all representing those different nuances, those different threads, those different realms, and those different processes, and the alchemy of those angels and the angelic beings and the power that they hold are all merging into us, removing us from a state of separation and taking us back into the one life. So the first sigils that we have for the purification of linear time, as shown in this document um, are about boundlessness, are very interesting. There's quite a few of them, but I'd like to read them as we go through because you're going to see where the world is in at this moment in time. And it gives us a higher understanding of what is going on. Sometimes we get, <clears throat> excuse me, we get very trapped in the surface appearance of things. We look at things and we go, oh my goodness, that's the way the world is, but it isn't. That's just surface appearance. What is going on cosmically is happening right now. So here we go. The first sigil of boundlessness for the removal of empowerment through proximity. And I'm not going to go into explanations of it. You can make your own notes as we're going along. And the second one, for the removal of influence through arrogance due to a sense of entitlement. The next one, for the dissolving of old hierarchies and their cosmic influences and tyrannies. For the dissolving of old unholy alliances of control and personal aggrandizement. For the removal of hierarchies based on sequences of creation. For the removal of governments designed to undermine, obscure and disconnect life forms from source. The next sigil for the removal of future schemes and strategies to seize control. For the removal of the bondage of black magic to blind and control cosmic beings. The next sigil. For the removal of all plans and mechanisms to bring back old stories and dreams of the past. Following on for that is for the removal of brainwashing and all controlling strategies of fear, greed, pain, protectiveness, anger and guilt. Next one for the removal of the hostile influences of the super gods and prime gods. For the removal of the ability to disseminate untruth about the source of existence. For the removal of the web of existence and the dissolving of old matrices of all types of subversive control. For the re-establishment of the recognition of the purity of the infinite. For the absolute trust in the benevolence of the expression of the infinite being, even when not understood. For the cooperative expression of the unimpeded flow and emphasis of infinite intent. For the replacing of the old masculine hierarchical regimes with power through merit. And number 18 is the final one. It's a huge, beautiful, incredibly developed sigil for the advent of the reign of peace and joy of the embodiment of the infinite being and the establishment of inspired dynamic balance. That's what we are talking about tonight, creating a state of being able to live an exuberant passion because simply we have let go of everything that belonged in the past. Again, you can use this wheel in the sigil of removal of the um, old hierarchies and living in boundlessness. You can just go on to spiritualjourneys.com. It'll take you two or three years back, but that's when this whole discussion really developed. And again, we're seeing the work this year of being able to understand what it is to live in boundlessness. And of course, another thing we've got to truly understand 
um, if you haven't been with Almi teachings for too long, is that what is happening right now, as the subject matter comes up within your heart, within your being, within your understanding, it is because it is so absolutely relevant right now on a cosmic level. There's nothing right or wrong about it. It simply is. And just to say thank you to Sandra Saradesi for the comment on Facebook today, where I just posted just a saying that suddenly come up for me and I felt I needed to share that. And it said, I am uh, because I can. And that was my passion for the day. That was my insight for the day. And she then delivered a beautiful rune reading for me that she just picked up at will and it just matched the whole experience together. So thank you, Sandra, for taking the time and making that effort. It is absolutely appreciated. Right, so there we're listening to um, aspects of the teachings around the Seer al -Min. We're understanding how Balvaspata healing is coming into play there, how it has nurtured all of these teachings, how it has nurtured all of these incredibly passion-driven, uh, exuberant, life-forming um, experiences that each one of us go through. And of course, this radio show hopefully is one where we can bring them all together and we can create a time for our light family to sit for one hour a week, either live as right now or in podcast form. And I must say, it's quite fascinating to watch the growing number of listeners as we look at the analytics around our radio show. So thank you very much for all of you who are following. Press follow right now, of course, and then you'll know when we are up live next time. Right, so Almin is now also talking about the seven perspectives of the feminine playing a role in this year of um, inculcating high magic. But unlike the masculine perspectives of external space, it's not always so obvious how to have a perspective of inner space. Almin explains how the first perspective, which is the adventurous perspective, is a nice way to learn how. And this is why I'm saying we are in this time now frame of entering exuberant passion because we're beginning to work on more an adventurous perspective. And uh, Nico and I are certainly seeing that for ourselves, developing different things in our lives we never even thought possible or never even thought about at one point. And there it is. And we're beginning to adopt and to work with it simply because the old paradigms are no longer working. Let's listen to Almi now. She talks about the seven perspectives of the feminine in high magic. The first thing to note about the importance of the seven perspectives of the feminine is that it is very, very major in the role that it plays in high magic. In high magic, the seven perspectives of the masculine and the seven perspectives of the feminine need to be equally lived. The seven perspectives of the feminine is from inner space. And we have not always got the knowledge of how to have an inner space perspective. Because the perspectives of the masculine that we usually look at, they're all almost a lens through which mind observes life. The lens has different facets, seven different facets, Life looks a little different if you look through any particular facet, but it is a mind-operated perspective. So how is perspective in inner space? It is a feeling. And when you look at the very first perspective, which is the adventurous perspective, one tends to think that really that should be a masculine one. It's a way the mind looks at life. Why is this the first of the seven feminine inner perspectives? Because the adventurous perspective is a really nice way to learn to have an inner perspective. And if you can get it with that one, normally the remaining six are easier. So let me explain. The adventurous perspective, if you're going on an adventure, you're feeling an exhilaration within. You're feeling an anticipation within. You're feeling it's mixed with feelings of hope, with feelings of glad expectations, with feelings that good things are coming, but it is a feeling that it makes. So. To learn to do inner perspectives, practice 
thinking of an adventure you want to go on. And make sure that in your thoughts, this adventure is completely, perfectly safe. It's just unknown. So let's say you're going on a photographic safari in Africa. Well, you'll be in a closed vehicle. There will be an experienced driver. But still, you don't know what you will encounter, whether there's two lions fighting or a giraffe being attacked or what you will catch on your camera. So unknown factors makes it an adventure and the safety makes it a nice adventure. Think up some scenario like that and really put the details in during a meditation so that eventually there is this feeling of excited anticipation inside. The adventurous perspective, once you have felt it for what you've conjured up in your mind, think of feeling that about your day. Because the day is a completely unknown territory. It is like a fluid expression of yourself, but you don't know how it's going to turn out or in what form. It's like a safari. Then try and keep that excited feeling and think about the day. Think about wonderful things happening in that day. Now you're starting to realize what an inner perspective is. It is a feeling of something. You're back in studio. I'm your host, Paul. You're listening to Radio Belvas, but I said Africa. Our theme for tonight is about Genesis, immortality, and exuberant passion. Absolutely incredible insights there from the mystic and Seer Almin. And we're also listening to transmissions from the infinite as I read them out from the book, The Thought That Fractured the Infinite, available on Spiritual Journeys. It is just so incredible to be able to have found this book yet again today um, and just have opened it and been able to see what I've been working on and written there in black and white, but in this case, of course, the different colors of red and blue and yellow. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's a question that is posed to the infinite there, and it says, what do the 300 glyphs found in each color represent? The answer, there are depths of color in each, the red, the yellow, the blue. There are a hundred shades in each color. Each shade is bonded to a specific frequency. So the question is, you mean like an emotional quality? Answer, exactly. Altogether, the colors make white light. Combined, the frequency or tones make the one note of creation found in incorruptible holy matter, which is adoration in action. So this is why I'm saying today, my feeling, my processes at the moment, my experiences, just at this moment is that we are now moving into this time of unbridled passion but we are definitely dissolving a lot of the density of the past as all these colors work through all of us so uh, yeah if you cannot find the formula of boundlessness which we've been speaking about please let us know by email or by messenger or facebook whatever it is and we'll make sure we give you a link to that in the third transmission from the infinite in the book the thought that fractured the infinite here we go. I tell now the general qualities of the stable combinations of light. For in wielding the alchemical potencies inherent in light, the colors must never be used separately, but only in combination. One, the first 100 equations. So remember, we're talking about the 100 color levels now. In the first 100 equations, the positive proactive aspect of the blue light and the negative receptive aspect of the yellow light are the most dominant, green. 
the dominant characteristic quality is creative. It is to be used to create what was not there before, such as abundance, fertility, solutions and so forth. Creation can only occur in alignment with my intent and will not respond to anything else. The alchemy of light is incorruptible. Number two, the second hundred equations have red and yellow as the most dominant colors. The negative or receptive aspects of red and the positive proactive of yellow determine the predominant characteristic of expansion, which is expressed in the color orange. These hundred equations enhance, expand and augment that which already exists. They would be used for growth in any area of life. The red-yellow dominance helps create dynamic balance to prevent stagnation. The blue-yellow combination prevents instability, especially where growth is rapid. They also produce contentment. The third 100 equations, using red and blue to make purple, have predominantly cleansing qualities. The positive proactive aspect of red and the feminine receptive aspect of blue are accentuated for the purposes of purification, of cleansing and the restoration of purity and innocence. This color combination is the only one that cannot be used to assist with a balance. So there we go. When we listen to the third 100 equations experience there as transmitted by the infinite, does it not kind of ring a bell with you within and say to you, this is the state of being where you are at at this moment in time. You are in a process of great purification, of cleansing, and the restoration of purity and innocence in your life. It's certainly something that I'm beginning to understand and work on on a great deal. Right, so we've come nearly to the end of our show, but I'd like to just play out as we started with um, one of my favorite TV personalities and speakers on an international level, Jason Silver, and he introduces his new uh, latest shot of awe here, by saying that passion exists at the intersection of three or more things you're really curious about. Stephen Kotler. And of course, those three things I'm talking about are love, praise, and gratitude. And as we learn to balance and exude those particular qualities 100% of the time, then of course, we've hit this next level of living in exuberant passion. So let's listen to Jason Silver, How to Find Your Passion. So there was a wonderful article by Stephen Kotler published in Forbes about how to find your passion. It's a question we ask ourselves every single day. We've all been told that a life of passion is a life that means something. But how do we identify our passions? It's not always easy. So one of the things that Stephen Kotler breaks down is that he says that passion essentially exists in the intersection between multiple things that you're curious about. So he says the first thing you should do if you want to identify your passion is to make a list of all the things that you're curious about, all the things that you wonder about. Be as specific as you can and then create kind of a Venn diagram and try to figure out where the things that you're curious about, three or more, intersect. And that's the sweet spot. That's where there is energy. That's where there is dopamine and neurobiology. Multiple streams of curiosity intersect at a space called passion, right? And then once you've identified your passion, then you can figure out how to turn that passion into a purpose. To turn that passion into a purpose, make a list of 15 things in the world, 15 challenges you'd like to see solved. And then figure out which one of those challenges can be served by your passion. So then you see curiosity, leads to passion. Multiple streams of curiosity leads to passion. Identifying problems in the world that can be served by your passion leads to purpose. And then, my friends, you've impregnated your life with a sense of significance, with a sense of meaning. And then you can go forth, my brothers. You can go forth. I thought it was a great article. Take note. Stephen Kotler's work, Flow Genome Project, How to Find Your Passion. back in studio there we were listening to Jason Silver as he talked about finding your passion 
And you may have noticed the link there about finding the midpoint of three aspects of life and working with all of that. What incredible exuberance he has. And of course, that's such an example of the way that we can all be by also not comparing ourselves with others, but simply being who we are in the moment in our absolute fullness. So Almin says to us, a life that flourishes is one that allows the new to effortlessly unfold through it whilst maintaining an eternal perspective. If you are the same as you were yesterday, then perhaps tomorrow needs some newness. That's my thought on it. Remember the red, the blue, the yellow. Thanks to the incredible healing modality of Balvaspata, which I feel has supported and just brought all this incredible nurturing growth as we move from a state of genesis into immortality and into life beyond of exuberant passion. I'm looking forward to sharing this journey with each one of you. Thanks to Nico for being in the studio with us tonight. Smooth show apparently, no technical faults, so we are very grateful for all of that. We are also incredibly grateful for having you with us and all the comments that you are sharing week by week. Thank you everyone for the messages that you are sending to us. Uh, if we haven't replied to your email, it's because our emails have been down the last few days, but we will be up and responding very, very shortly to all of that. So here's the Sia Almin again, just going out with her saying, a life that flourishes is one that allows the new to effortlessly unfold through it whilst maintaining an eternal perspective. Next week, we are going to be going into the song of self and the song of creation and the dynamics around all of that with a surprise guest. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you for joining us and good night. Love, praise and gratitude to you all. You've been listening to Radio Balbaspata, South Africa. Thank you for listening and sharing in our discussion. Should you have any questions with regards to the healing modality of Balbaspata or have any healing needs, please send us an email to info at balbaspata.co.za or add comments to our page on speaker.com so we can work on providing a suitable response. We now close this episode with the eternal ascension qualities of love, praise, gratitude and trust and look forward to sharing again with you next week. Goodbye.